Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We have a special guest in the building. Yes, 2020 presidential candidate. That's right, Andrew Yang. Welcome, sir. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> How's everything with you? Good morning. Morning. Yeah, th- this is a, a real privilege, so thank you. Who is Andrew Yang, for people who don't know? Well, uh, where do you want me to start? Uh, I'm an entrepreneur who uh, spent the last six and a half years running an organization I started called Venture for America that helped create several thousand jobs in Detroit, Cleveland, Baltimore, St. Louis, Birmingham, and other cities around the country. And I realized that the reason why Donald Trump won the election, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, there are a bunch of them. But one of the big ones is that we automated away four million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all the swing states you needed to win. And my friends in Silicon Valley, and I've got a lot of them, know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we're now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and on and on through the economy. So uh, I went to Washington and was like, hey, what are we going to do about the fact that we're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the country? And the answers I got were uh, really disappointing uh, to horrifying. And I worked in the Obama administration. I was a presidential, or as I call it, the, the good White House. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and so a lot of the people I was talking to were Democrats. Um, and for whatever reason, no one wanted to actually rise to this particular challenge. And so I'm running for president to help us evolve and advance to the next stage of our economy. Well, there's a lot of things that you said just now. Uh, uh, number one, it was the Black House when you was there. OK, because Obama was running it. But you wrote a book called The War on Normal People. It's right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah you I did. talked about automation and AI resulting in the elimination of human jobs. That's that's a lot of people's fear. So you see that. It's coming. very scary. But a lot of people don't address it. They act like technology and automation is a great thing. And we're going to hire people who are going to control the automation. But in reality, a lot of people will be out of jobs. And you see, you yeah. see that coming? Like, Oh, it, it's not just coming. Uh, it's already been happening. And mm-hmm. if you look at the numbers, uh, we lost 4 million manufacturing jobs to automation over the last number of years. And if you go to Detroit uh, or Cleveland or St. Louis, you see the aftermath. Uh, and I studied economics in college. And so according to economic theory, all those workers would get retrained, reskilled, find new jobs, and all would be well. But then when you actually go to the communities, you see that about half of them left the workforce and never worked again. And of that group, about half filed for disability. Then you saw a massive surge in uh, alcohol use and uh, drug overdoses depression, and suicides course. and depression. And so there's a lot of despair, a, lo- a lot of suffering, uh, and it's going unaddressed around the country. And unfortunately, it's just going to ramp up. So one of the things I'm trying to tell people is like, look, this is no longer speculative. This is not like, a, oh, we should keep our eye on this. This has been ripping a hole in our communities and our society for years now, and it's about to, to pick up steam. So why are Trump supporters worried about Mexicans when they should be worried about the robots taking the jobs? That's my exact point, man. It is not immigrants. Uh, immigrants have nothing to do with the economic distress many Americans are feeling. It's the fact that technology is advancing to a point where our labor is less and less central to the economy. So, so build the do- wall around Silicon Valley. So yeah, what do we do about that? Yeah, what, what do we do indeed? <laughs> what's, the, what's the solution? So the solution I'm proposing, uh, and anyone who's heard about my campaign knows this, I'm proposing that we declare a dividend of $1,000 a month for every American adult starting at age 18. That's the universal basic <clears throat> income. Yes. They're proposing. The universal basic income, which I rebranded the freedom dividend because it tests better with more Americans with the word freedom in it. <laughs> uh, and so... What the, will that do? Yeah, because a, a lot of us have never achieved true liberation in this country. Yeah, true. I, I mean, it's the truth. Yeah. It's one reason why Martin Luther King championed this plan and principle uh, in 1967, the the year before he was assassinated. Uh, He called it the guaranteed minimum income. Uh, Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country. Mm -hmm. This is a very American idea. So it seems far out to us now that, hey, we should just have a dividend where everyone gets a thousand bucks a month. Uh, But we've been talking about this for decades, and it came this close to being law in 1971. It actually passed the House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon. Uh, Milton Friedman and a thousand economists signed a study saying this would be great for America. And then one state has had a dividend for 37 years where everyone in that state gets between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked. What state is that? That's Alaska. Really? Yeah, you go to Alaska right now, you live there for a year, and everyone in your family gets between one and $2,000 a year from the petroleum dividend. Mm. It was passed 37 years ago by a Republican governor, and Alaska's a deep red state. This Republican governor shows up, 1982, and he's like, hey, there's a lot of oil money. Who would you rather get it, the government who's just going to screw it up or you, the Alaskan people? 
And then the Alaskan said, us, please. And he's like, I thought you'd say that. And suddenly he passed his dividend. And now it's wildly popular, has created thousands of jobs, has improved children's health, uh, has a decreased income inequality. And what I'm going around the country saying is, look, what Alaska is doing with oil money, we can do for the entire country with technology money. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is the universal basic income? The universal basic income is a policy where every everyone in a society gets a certain amount of money, free and clear, to do whatever they want, no mm -hmm. questions asked. Can I ask you this? If you make a decent amount of money, then you don't get that universal basic income, or do you get that in addition to what you make? Oh, you get it in addition to what you make. This is a right of citizenship. It has nothing to do with your income, employment mm -hmm. status. Uh, everyone gets it. Now, I, I, How is that possible? <clears throat> Where's the money coming from? Uh, so You said technology, but... Yeah. So right now, when you guys see the headlines... Amazon paid zero in taxes last year despite right. record profits. Netflix paid zero in taxes last year despite record profits. And it's not their fault. It's just our system's really poorly designed to have the American public benefit from new innovations and advances in technology. And that's the trap we're in. Because I was just in Iowa. I sound very politician when I say that shit. But I was, <laughs> I was just in Iowa at a truck stop. Um, and there were truck truckers wall to wall. Uh, and those jobs are exactly the jobs that are going to be displaced in the next five to 10 years. And so who wins? Who wins from artificial intelligence? Who wins from all the new innovations? It's going to be Amazon, Google, Uber, Facebook, the biggest tech companies that will have uh, the AI that will then start displacing workers. And the American people will not see much money from that at all. Andrew, you're selling this all wrong. Build a wall around Silicon stop Valley. It, stop Say it. it. Question, Build what, the wall. Stop it. What made you want to run for president? Is it the fact that Donald Trump was an entrepreneur and made it in, or was it something that you were looking at for a long time? Because we're starting to see more and more entrepreneurs, people that don't necessarily know or started in politics, really jump into the presidential campaign. I certainly would never be running for president if a, a number of things had not happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the main one that Donald Trump won in 2016. So imagine being the guy who's getting medals from the White House for creating jobs around the country realizing that your work is like pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. Wow. And that the medals you're getting are uh, nonsense, really. Like you're getting pats on the back for doing stuff that's not actually going to solve the problem. And the problem leads to Donald Trump, and for whatever reason, no one wants to talk about it. And that's why I'm running for president. I'm a parent. I've got two young boys who are six and three, uh, and I'm not going to bring them up in a country that's going to fall apart around them which is right now where we are going to go if we keep scapegoating immigrants and people have nothing to do with the problems we're experiencing instead of focusing on the, the facts on the ground, which is that technology uh, is driving our economy to, to, uh, you know, to places that it's never been. Why should I vote, somebody, vote for somebody with zero legislative experience? I feel like that's what the mistake that we made this time. Not we, because I didn't vote for him, but, you know. Yeah, I was hoping not, man. No. It's like, what, what mistake did you make? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't vote for the guy. Mm -hmm. but, well, what I've been going around saying is like, look, Donald Trump uh, is a bad president because he's a bad president. Uh, you know, it's it's not like all entrepreneurs are Donald Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur, most entrepreneurs feel like Donald Trump gives us all a bad name and he's more of a marketing charlatan than he is a real builder or someone who elevates people and, and builds strong teams and organizations. So it's up to the American people to decide what kind of background they want. But I would suggest that the American people have been casting about for some kind of change agent for years because we've sensed that our government is falling way behind the curve. That's how Donald Trump won. Right. Right. He was different. So Donald Trump wins on that. But then you see Bernie Sanders uh, achieve outsized success last time because, again, people see that we need to make big changes. And even Barack Obama's uh, election in 2008, when I voted for him twice, like you can see the American people have been hungry for some sort of accelerant to help catch up and modernize our government because we know Washington DC is stuck decades in the past. Now, what, you know, of course, you know, being an entrepreneur, and, and I notice that a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people that make a lot of money usually vote Republican just because of the tax breaks and things like that. So why 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 are you voting towards Democrat or why are you you running as a Democrat, Democrat running as a Democrat <laughs> opposed to Republican, which I would feel that most entrepreneurs or people with some some long bank are. Oh, well, uh, if you look at my background, you know, I mean, I went to Brown University, so you kind of know what that, that looks like. <laughs> we, have a lot, we have a lot of <laughs> things. Brother went there. My brother went to Brown, and his brother went to Wesleyan, and I went to Wesleyan. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you look at my, my platform, it lines up with Democrat and progressive priorities really across the board on everything from uh, reproductive rights to, to gay rights uh, to gun safety to everything else. So it was very natural. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was, again, part of the Obama administration. Running as a Democrat was very natural.
What what is your universal basic income plan? How much do you want to give people? A thousand a month. Every every American adult gets a thousand dollars a month starting mm-hmm. at age eighteen, and uh, that would be a game changer for tens of millions of American families because we know. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 57% can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. Mm-hmm. And what I, I'm telling people is, look, we have the money. Like, our economy is up to $20 trillion, up $5 trillion in the last 12 years alone. We're the richest, most advanced economy in the history of the world. We can easily afford a $1,000 a month dividend. <laughs> you want to give me $1,000 a month? Yeah. Until I die? Until yes. 64, right? Oh. Well, yeah, oh. no, it, it's until you die, but if you have Social Security, <laughs> then it overlaps. You don't get both. That's now not going to cause math... And, math uh, Mass inflation? No, it will not. Why not? Well, I'll give you a couple data points on the inflation. So we printed $4 trillion for the banks during the bailout, and there was no inflation in consumer goods. And if you look at what's happening right now in your own life, a lot of stuff's getting cheaper or better. That's electronics, clothing, uh, cars, media, food for the most part. All that stuff's staying essentially constant in price or getting cheaper or more sophisticated. Now, what's going up in price? What's driving us all crazy? Housing, education, health care. Mm-hmm. And those three uh, three things are not being driven by the fact that we have lots of money to spend. It's not being driven by, like, purchasing power. Um, health care is being driven by the private insurance mm-hmm. I- industry and the fact you have this opaque pricing and you're not actually, um, you know, negotiating price for any interaction. Education is because college has gone up in price 250% and families feel they have no choice but to pay, so they just take out massive loans, which is its own huge set of problems that we have to try and uh, address. And I would forgive a lot of the student loans because I think a lot of them were immorally generated. And it's a stimulus of the economy. Young people should be starting families, buying homes, starting businesses, and not paying off this phantom Mm -hmm. uh, student loan debt. Set to Sally Mae. Yeah, I, I had 100K in law school debt. For years, I used to call it my mistress because I was like writing a check every month to some like family in another town. I was like, I hope they're having a good time on this money. <laughs> um, so I get it. Like, you know, people should not be uh, just servicing this loan forever. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and then housing. Housing is the trickiest one. Housing is because we feel like we have to live in certain areas in order to access certain economic opportunities. So like the, the housing prices in New York and San Francisco are obviously gone through the roof. Um, and, uh, and part of that is local, part of that is zoning ordinances, and you can't develop affordable housing. But the, the point of it is, is that uh, we're not increasing the money supply by enough that you would see massive inflation. And the way most consumer products work is that there'll still be price sensitivity among consumers and competition among firms for your business. There's when, no reason you'd see a massive spike in prices. You don't think corporations would say, okay, I know everybody's getting $1,000 a month now, so let's raise the prices a little bit? Well then, uh, so Even on just regular everyday products. Oh yeah. So what I say to people is like, look, let's say you're you're in uh, Missouri, and then President Yang, 2021. I'm like freedom dividend time. Let's do this thing. And then the checks start going out, and then you're like the burger joint, and you're like, ooh, everyone's got a thousand bucks a month. I'm gonna raise my burger prices from five bucks to ten bucks. If you walk into that burger joint, you're gonna be like, what the heck happened? This yeah. thing was five bucks last week. And then you're gonna go to the taco place or the deli. And then every restaurant has to try and gouge you simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And then it just takes one restaurant to be like, you know what? I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not gonna... doing that. Yeah. And then True. everyone goes to that restaurant exactly. and then they're all like, oh, I, I can't. Turns out I can't stick it to people because it's not like if you get a thousand bucks a month, you're all of a sudden made of money. Yeah. Like you're still going to be. Of money though, you're just you know... able to get some basic things. Now, what about uh, health care? Well, hold on. Before you do that, but you, you said we have money. When you said we have a lot of money. But all, oh, yeah, like, we don't we have a, a debt of like $16 trillion that we owe? Yeah. So it's a little more than that, actually. Mm. But uh, so one thing I'm saying to people is like, look, we have the money. I mean, again, Amazon paid zero taxes. Mm -hmm. Like Jeff Bezos is worth $160 billion for a reason. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of wealth in our society. And and that's... um, and the well, fact that divorced too, though, so it's, it's going to be, it might be 80, but yeah, it's still yeah. not 80. Mm-hmm. He'll, he'll, be, still fine. he'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. He'll be good. <laughs> um, so the fact that we've got a lot of past mismanagement and a lot of waste in the system does not mean we do not have the money. We have the money. Hmm. All right. Now, what about uh, universal health care? Do you believe that along with this universal basic income, we should also have universal health care? Oh, yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm for a single payer, Medicare for all. It makes no sense to have uh, Americans... Real, more stressed out about paying for care than we are getting well. If we get sick or injured or our kids get sick or injured, it's backwards. It's immoral. Uh, and I'll tell you, this is another thing where people are like, where are you going to get the money? Where are you going to get the money? We spend 18% of GDP on our health care, twice as much as other countries, to worse results. We have plenty of money. It's just the money's not on the public bottom line yet, but it should be. 
So I've been the CEO of a business, and I'll t I tell people very honestly, like our healthcare system makes it harder to hire people. It makes it harder to treat people like full-time employees because you just want to turn them all into contractors and say, hey, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you're just healthcare. A, absolutely. Yeah, um, it makes it harder to start a business, makes it harder to change jobs. Mm -hmm. It's actually this giant impediment on our economic dynamism and growth. How many people out there have businesses that they might have started if our healthcare was covered by the, the public sector, which it should be? Right. So, so I'm for universal yeah, healthcare. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah they said in the future most people are going to be freelancers just because companies are trying to just hire contractors so they don't have to pay for healthcare. Yeah, 94 percent of the new jobs created in this country since 2005 have been temporary gig or contract jobs. So tying that don't have healthcare benefits. So tying healthcare to your job makes less and less sense, and we just need to get with the program mm -hmm. and evolve and say, look. Your job and healthcare are unrelated. Yeah, like you said, a lot of people don't want to take that jump because they know if they leave their nine to five, they lose healthcare and their family loses healthcare. I'm gonna they don't want to take that jump to be an entrepreneur. I'm gonna tell you guys a true story. Like I told my wife, I was as gonna opposed to. I know, as opposed <laughs> to everything else I said. It's all no, but this is a true story. <laughs> so, I go to, so I go to my wife mm -hmm. and I say, "Hey, babe, I'm gonna run for president." And her first question is, "What are we gonna do about healthcare?" <laughs> that's, 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 like, 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 that's a true like, story. I remember reading, I think I read something about the, the, the UBI once. It said they wanted to get rid of welfare and social service programs. So wouldn't that leave people who qualify for all these benefits in like worse economic positions because they'll have to pay for their own health care and child care? And that, like that? that is totally not my plan. I okay. mean, there, there are people that have been for UBI in the past who mm -hmm. are like, ooh, we're going to like get rid of all the social services. I think that's crazy. You can't take away programs that people are literally relying upon for their day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month survival, uh, it'd be vastly destructive. Um, so my plan is to make the freedom dividend available to everyone, and it's like a parallel supplement to the existing program. On top of everything they're already getting. So what I'm saying is, look, uh, here's the freedom dividend. If you opt in, then you're saying, I prefer that to other stuff. So it's not that it's an either or, but we don't take anything from anyone. So we're not going to make anyone worse off. But if you opt into this, you're saying, I would prefer $1,000 cash, unconditional, no reporting, no monitoring, n no requirements. I can spend the money on whatever I want. You got to pay taxes that. on that $1,000? No, you don't. Oh, so, this is so, great. So yeah. I would have to compare it to what I'm already making in Social Security. And then make a decision. Make a decision of what you want, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the cost for this come down to something much more manageable. Because a lot of people just do the basic math and they're like, $12,000 for every adult in the country. That's like $3 trillion. That's a lot. But because of the current spending, it actually brings the price tag down very, very quickly. Uh, and then if you put on this tech tax where we have a value added tax that gets the gains from all these new innovations and self-driving cars and trucks, like that gets the price tag down very, very fast. So this is much more affordable than people think. Now, I heard you say that. You said that the money is already there, but then I also read about the, the value added tax. And you say you want to put 10 percent on all goods and services. So yeah. what is it? Is the money already there or you have to put the 10 percent tax on it in order to get the money? Well, so the reason why there are all these people who are looking like AOC at like very high marginal income tax rate or Elizabeth Warren with like a wealth tax, like we realize that this economy has gotten entirely unbalanced where you mm -hmm. have, you know, the top 1% hoovering up all the gains, like a winner take all economy. So the question is, how do you balance that out? And, uh, and so to me, uh, a value added tax is a much more efficient way to do it. And it's what every other country has already done because a value added tax is very hard to game. Like if you're Jeff Bezos, you're Amazon, you're going to have to pay it as long as you're doing business in the U.S. So you could build a value added tax where it exempts certain consumer staples so it falls more on, on the affluent than people who are just like buying diapers and the rest of it. Um, but the reason why every other country uh, that's an advanced economy, aside from us, has already done it, is that it actually will get us a slice of every Amazon transaction, every Facebook ad, every Google search, every robot truck mile, and bring it to the American people, put the money in our hands, and then what are we going to do? We're going to spend that money in the economy. It's going to create two plus million jobs. And Amazon and the gang are still going to get some of that money back. You know what I mean? But at least it comes through our hands. We are the owners and shareholders of this country. And this is a dividend for us. Now, let me ask you a question. Now, now you talk about Amazon. And I know Amazon has to play tax. you down, by the way. You see her? Oh, Marianne's not my competition. Marianne, oh. Marianne's awesome. <laughs> now, Am now, we talk about Amazon with, the, with, with not having tax. But let, let's say we decide to tax Amazon, right? Doesn't Amazon <clears throat> close up? Go to a country someplace where they get huge tax breaks and then we lose all those jobs again? Well, again, every other advanced economy already has a value added tax, and Europe's value added tax is twice what I'm proposing. So, where are they going to go? Like, we are the number one consumer market. It's not like they're going to stop selling here. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that as president, I would make all of the tax incentives provided by cities and states for companies to move 
100% taxable. I would get rid of that stuff because it makes no sense to have cities and states fighting to give tax breaks to the Amazons of the world where, from a national point of view, we don't care what city or state they're in. Right. Uh, and Amazon should be making choices based upon what's best for their business, not who they can get the biggest concessions from. Now, you're saying $1,000 a month. You're saying free health care. Now, what about weed and what about colleges? Free college, free, free tuition, too? No, no, I, yeah. I said public health care. Public yeah, health care, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, yeah, because I was going to ask you then? about marijuana. And, and marijuana, le- yeah. And legalizing marijuana, there's a lot of money to be made from that as well. So what yeah. do you think about that, and where, where should that money go? Uh, I'm for the uh, legalization of marijuana, remove it from the controlled substance list, in part because our administration of the criminal laws are deeply racist. Uh, it's very obvious to everyone. So... Uh, on April 20th, 2021, I'm going to pardon everyone who's in uh, prison for a low-level uh, nonviolent drug offense. I like your marketing strategy, 420, makes, baby. Because <laughs> it makes no sense to have people in jail for stuff that's legal in, in some parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And then there'd be a lot of money, and, and I know there are bills that want to channel that money to African-American mm-hmm. businesses and communities, which is a great idea. Yeah, because we were affected so much by these marijuana laws. Does yeah, An- yeah, completely. Does Andrew Yang have a black agenda? Do you have an agenda specifically for black people? Well, uh, a lot of it overlaps with um, with my overall agenda because I, I I think that the you know the freedom dividend and, and uh, uh, universal health care would go a long way. But I'm for getting rid of private prisons. I think it makes no sense to have prisons that have a profit motivation. Why do y'all think actually, all black people in jail? Um, oh, oh, I mean, again, that affects everyone. Yeah. Um, I, I'm for uh, dramatically increasing the federal allotment uh, HBCUs. Because the, the problem with education right now is it's become a business. And so what happens is schools end up benefiting by catering to the affluent because they'll donate more money and they can pay full freight and the rest of it. And so you have these HBCUs that are, have an incredible historical mission, have been shown to, to elevate uh, you know hundreds of thousands of African Americans. But because they don't have these crazy endowments that some of the rich schools do, that they're struggling. Mm-hmm. And so the federal government can help shore that up. The government, in my mind, exists in part to counterbalance the excesses and perversions of the marketplace. And right now in American life, the market is just running amok. It's overrunning everything. And that's what we have to stop. And the one great way to stop that, get this dividend into everyone's hands, and that'll help us reclaim our democracy. Why would the top 1% of the country, or even just people that's doing well in life, need an extra $1,000 a month? Well, like, uh, Should it really be for universal? Should it really be for everybody? There are uh, so there are a few reasons why I think it should be universal. Um, well, one in this example is like Jeff Bezos and the guy going to be paying hundreds of millions, billions of dollars into it. So we don't care if they get a thousand bucks a month. It's like mm-hmm. you know, it's just like a reminder that they're still uh, a human being and a citizen. Um, but if you try and make it income based, it ends up being a rich to poor transfer, and then it ends up being politicized in a particular way. Where if you make it universal, it's like, look, it's just you're an American, you're a citizen, you get a thousand bucks a month. Um, and then you end up getting rid of all the administration. You get get getting rid of all the reporting. You get rid of all the oh my circumstances changed or I'm going to underreport because I want to be below this line so I can get the money. So you get rid of all of that stuff, mm. and then you get rid of the stigma because one of the problems with our existing programs is that you know like there's a stigma attached to, to being in them, and then everyone politically attacks them. And this you can't attack. And Alaska is the proof. Because in a deep red state, Alaskans love their dividends so much that they said they would accept higher taxes to keep the dividend. That's how much they love it. I see you're also doing this uh, plan with a couple of families, right? You're ch- uh, testing it out to show how it does work? Yeah, I'm personally giving 1000 bucks a month to uh, a family in New Hampshire and a family in Iowa. And shocker, they like it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, it's like How did you people decide what family you were gonna give because there's a couple families up here that wouldn't mind. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I mean, if I'm president, man, I want to do it for everyone. And if I had the money, I would. Do oh, it you want to pay? You want to pay it out your own pocket for everybody? Um, if I, if, <laughs> I mean, it, it, okay, you would also be making four million dollars a year as president. Um, so they make yeah, that so, much. They don't make no, that. they don't. They make they, they make they make four hundred thousand. But Angela's 000, right. But that, it, I'm talking about his proposal. Uh, uh, yeah. So my proposal is that presidents get a ten x raise to four million dollars. But, oh. but, but then they're not allowed to take any for profit for personal gain speaking fees or uh, board opportunities or any of that stuff after the fact because the, it's human nature. After they finish running, they can't do any. After books their or, term is over. Oh, they can do books, but they can't join corporate boards for money. Do, take speaking fees for money. Because it's human nature. Let's say I'm president, and then there's some rich CEOs hanging around in the Oval Office. Mm-hmm. And I know that three years from now, they can give me $400,000 just to show up and schmooze with their clients and employees. 
it's human nature for me to be a little nicer to them, be a little softer on them, to be like, oh, you know, I should just make friends with this person because I'm going to end up hanging out on the jet with them after I'm president. So you get rid of that motivation. You say, look, I can't take a dime from anyone for personal gain. You're going to pay me enough so that you know I work for the people. But that's it. We mm-hmm. have to stop worshiping the almighty dollar. And that starts from the top. And it, this raise can go into effect the president after me. I really do not care. But we just have to clean up our government so it actually works for us. And it's clear that I that's the case. I don't have a problem with that because I feel like presidents are public servants. And I feel like all public servants need to be getting paid more money. Teachers, police officers, But yeah. a four-year, uh, $15 million deal? I don't. It's, you're the president. That's a lot. You man. get up. You get more to your ball players than your freaking like entertainers. Mm-hmm. Why shouldn't the president get four million a year? Yeah, and, so. and 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 then say no more uh, profit taking after that. I president think that's a no fair bills. deal. He ain't got to pay no cable bill, no house bill, no mortgage, no car. Still note, a no tough job. Note. Still a tough job, sir. Uh, apparently, I don't, I don't know. My my wife was uh, reading Michelle Obama's book, and apparently they <laughs> account for like White House like household expenses and like he had stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read I read his book. Yeah, they pay for all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah they do. Oh, yeah, St- uh, Stockton, California. Um, they, they, they're going to be the first American city to experiment with free money? Yeah, I, I was with uh, Mayor Tubbs on a panel um, just a few months ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's tremendous that they're funding these basic income trials in Stockton. Mayor Tubbs is a great guy. Uh, I know some of the people that are funding that trial. Uh, but I will say, guys, like this, it's embarrassing that a lot of the money for these trials is coming from private individuals. Because mm-hmm. coming in the 60s and 70s, the United States government was giving money to thousands of American families to test out whether this sort of program works. Mm-hmm. And it should be the public sector leading the charge on this because we're entering the age of AI. We're going to have self-driving cars and trucks in five to 10 years. 30% of malls are going to close in the next four years, thanks to Amazon. Two and a half million call center workers in the U.S. are going to get replaced by AI. There was a study in The Guardian that said the, the median African-American household net worth is going to be zero by 2053. Like in 34 years. You guys see that study? No. Well, yeah, you should look it up. And so why are they forecasting that African-American net worth is going to go to zero? It's because of this economic tidal wave that is coming. This economic tidal wave is going to wipe out many working class jobs. Uh, and it's going, to be, it's going to be the equivalent of a natural disaster. And we know what happens in a natural disaster. Who suffers? Poor people that don't have the resources, people of color. Uh, and the same thing is going to happen in this. So that's why I'm running for president. Is I can see the tidal wave coming very, very clearly. How do you? Why, why isn't? What's different between welfare and government assistance in U, U, UBI? Well, the, the the big shift we have to make is instead of seeing it as again like uh, oh like you're down in your luck like things aren't working out so here's something to get you up to a certain point mm-hmm. but then if you do better we take it away like uh, that that's a way the way a lot of our current programs are designed in the dividend. Uh, you get it. You do better. You keep the dividend. You keep what you're making, too. It uh, aligns your incentives much more closely. And it, again, it gets rid of the stigma. Uh, it makes us all uh, shareholders of our collective progress. And then if someone comes up with some great innovation, you feel like, OK, at least I'm getting a, a little piece of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then we can start having a better attitude towards like our shared future. You know what I love about you, Andrew? I love the fact that you're up here discussing solutions and not problems. You're not running on a anti-Trump campaign, you actually have ideas. So that it pains me that you probably don't have a shot in hell of winning. So are you really... Oh, yeah, we're going to find out, brother. I'm just asking, do you, <laughs> are, you, are you are you running to actually win or just to disrupt the system? Um, we raised almost 600 k last month, um, which is more than just about every major candidate except for Bernie, and no one's heard of me. Uh, so you got to ask, how the heck did that happen? Uh, I'm talking sense, and like, you sa- and like you said... Well, I mean, now, thanks to you all, like some more people have heard of me, which I'm, I'm very happy for. Um, but you're right. Trump is a symptom. Mm-hmm. What is the disease? The disease is the fact that we're getting pushed into economic distress. The disease is this mindset of scarcity that has overtaken our people, because if you can't pay your bills, then it's very, very hard to be clear thinking and optimistic about the future. The disease is increasingly that we're going to be competing against machines AI, software, robots that are going to be able to outdo us in terms of capital efficiency. This is the disease. So how do you cure the actual disease? Most politicians do not want to touch this with a 10-foot pole because they don't have real solutions. And the solution I'm going to suggest is that we share the bounty from all this economic progress as fast as possible. Mm. And that's why I'm running for president. Build the wall around Silicon Valley. That has to be your slogan. You know, you know. Uh, Shut up, man. <laughs> now, what about the you know what about the slander? You know, Donald Trump goes hard. He will slander everybody. Are you ready for that? You ready to get down dirty with with with, with the shenanigans? 
Well, we, we joke around the HQ uh, what his nickname for me is going to be. Oh, and gosh. we've come up with Comrade Yang. Comrade Yang. Why Comrade Yang? You know, because it's a little bit, like, racially tinged. It makes me seem like this far-out socialist, like, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm looking forward to this. I mean, these guys in Iowa came up to me, and they said, I voted for Donald Trump. I'm going to vote for you. you so one person said, you're actually what I hoped for when I voted for Donald Trump. Wow. Um, <laughs> so I can get some Trump supporters behind me because I'm trying to address the same problems that got him elected. Mm -hmm. But whereas his solutions were all backwards, it was like build the wall, turn the clock backwards, bring back the jobs. I'm saying we have to turn the clock forwards. We have to accelerate our society and our notions of our own value and work. And one of the examples I use is my wife is at home with our two kids, uh, six and three, one of whom is autistic. Mm -hmm. And right now the market values her work at zero, GDP values her work at zero, and that's completely messed up. We know the work she's doing is more valuable and difficult and important. Absolutely. Uh, and so we need to evolve in the way we see value. And this $1,000 a month dividend, one of the things it would do, right now there are millions of American women in exploitative or abusive jobs or relationships because they lack the economic freedom to actually make a change in their situation. So if the Democratic Party is going to talk about empowering women, you know what's going to empower women? A thousand bucks a month. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a thousand bucks a month and then, you know, you're, you're uh, in some job that's exploiting you or some, like, uh, you know, relationship that's not good to you. Then you can be like, I don't need this. You know, Are you the only candidate away. that's uh, believing in this universal basic income? I am the only candidate championing it thus far, but I have a feeling I'm going to have some company after it sweeps the nation. Everyone wakes up. We're in a democracy. There's nothing stopping a majority of us from declaring ourselves a dividend. Nothing at all. They came Declaring this close ourselves before. a dividend? Declaring a dividend. ourselves, giving ourselves a dividend. Some money. De yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you said, you said declaring ourselves a dividend. Yeah. So, so what happens in, in like corporate language, shareholders get together and declare themselves a dividend. Okay. And so this is what happens with like Microsoft or Coca-Cola. They're like, hey, we're sitting on all this money. Let's declare a dividend for mm -hmm. ourselves. So what I'm saying is there's nothing stopping the majority of citizens of a country from declaring ourselves a dividend. There's nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And after people wake up to that reality, then it's going to sweep the nation. And then I have a feeling a bunch of other Democrats are going to be like, you know what? I'm kind of for that, too. Um, but first, we need to make the case that this is what we need to do as, as a people together. Um, technology wise, how do we keep up? but also make sure that people still aren't losing their jobs to automation, to robots. Well, and, and so this is really the danger, is that there's already a reaction where some people are saying, look, we need to outlaw robot trucks because there are so many people that rely upon that job. There are 3.5 million truckers. There are another 5 million Americans who work at truck stops, motels, and diners that rely upon the truckers getting out every day and having a meal. So it would be disastrous to replace those truckers with robots uh, in the next 5 to 10 years. But on the other hand, uh, you're looking at accidents that kill 4,000 people uh, a year with human truck drivers, that you might be able to reduce that number. You're looking at fuel efficiency savings because the robot trucks can convoy together and there's lower wind resistance. So it's actually good for the earth, maybe, if you have robot trucks. Yeah, but they can put you things a... on cars that 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 stop the accidents and, and all the stuff that they're creating now. Right now, in, in my, my wife's car, I can't get into an accident. I cannot hit a wall. That's a good car, man. Like, like, it, it, it has so many senses <laughs> no, it so many senses on it that it stops. Like, like it, you, they can put that on vehicles as well. Well, so what I'm saying is that where America does not want to be in is in a let's stop progress mode. And we are inching towards the let's stop progress mode because uh, Americans are going to look up and be like, wait, is this really what we want? Mm -hmm. There are going to be a lot of truckers that protest robot trucks 100 percent. And only 13 percent of truck drivers are unionized. So there's no collective negotiation or bargain. Most of these truckers, like small mom and pop, own their own trucks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there are going to be protests. And the question is, what are we doing as a country? So my plan is to say, look, this is such a massive transition that we should have a trucker transition czar who takes some of the gains from robot trucks and starts trying to create a soft landing for displaced truckers and the freedom dividend and trying to reconstitute our economy as fast as we can. This is what pisses me off about the AI conversation. If robots are going to take over the world, then let's just stop building them. We're the ones building the robots. Just hit the off switch. <laughs> yeah. like, why do we keep building them if we well, know they're going to take over well, the world? Well, he's talking about the benefits of having that because it will cut down on other things, like you said, accidents and, and it's better for the earth. Better for the earth. It's going to save $168 billion a year. Uh, and so if you're the United States and you're literally like, hey, guys, let's uh, ban robot trucks and then every other major economy has right. robot trucks. We have to keep up. Too. You really are shooting yourself in the foot. You're like, hey, we're, we're literally going to spend an extra $168 billion to maintain these trucker jobs. And the trucker jobs are really physically demanding and brutal. 
like 80% of the truckers have uh, early markers for chronic disease. They're sitting in a truck, you know, like 11, 12 hours a day so for like four days a week. To make money. Yeah, so this is the question. And this is, and it's not just the truckers, man. I mean, like I saw what happened to the manufacturing workers. What happened to them is going to happen to the truckers. We don't talk about it as much, but being a retail clerk is the most common job in this country. Mm-hmm. Even the tolls and bridges. There's no more, there's no real tolls and bridges so anymore. stop building the robots. Turn, hit the off switch. Or we just start dispensing mm-hmm. the bounty as fast as possible and we start. So if you imagine a country after I'm president, 2021, freedom dividend goes out. What do you see a massive increase in? Arts, creativity, journalism, entrepreneurship, volunteering, participation in, in uh, you know, uh, nonprofits and religious organizations. Like all that stuff's going to surge after you put $12,000 a year into everyone's hands. And so when you talk about the meaning of life, Charlemagne, I mean, like I'm going to suggest that, that that is the question of this era. Like what are the truck drivers going to do? Yeah, like that. that is the question. And we have to start trying to provide real <laughs> answers instead of, you know, they need just, a job. They, you can't just say what are they gonna do. They gonna be it's gonna be hurt. A lot of people, a lot of people are losing jobs now because of these robots. I just told yeah. y'all what, the st- what to do. Who you, who you, who's gonna turn it off? Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> what you talking about? You know, you gonna hit the off switch. Well, do you think that we need to retrain people about technology and learning how to code and learning how to do other things to be more advanced? All right. So, so this is something I get really, really animated about. Uh, we can talk about turning coal miners into software engineers or whatever. Um, but the reality is that if you're, uh, you know, if you're, you've been a coal miner for 20 years or a trucker for 12 years, like, there's no reason to think that you're gonna like being a software engineer or that mm-hmm. you can become a software engineer. You just might not be smart enough. Uh, only eight percent of jobs are in STEM fields, and 92 percent are not. So saying, hey, we're gonna somehow turn the 92 percent into the eight percent, like, does not make any sense. And the only reason you're even trying is because you're so brainwashed by the market logic, where you're like, oh, if you don't have economic value, then you have no value. Uh, and so because your job doesn't work now, I'm going to have to turn you into a coder or something, which is ridiculous on its face. So we have to start valuing ourselves intrinsically and design an economy that actually works for human beings. To your point, Charlemagne, it's like if the economy doesn't work for us, what's the point? Yeah. So what we have to do instead of measuring capital efficiency and GDP, we have to start measuring things like childhood success rates, mental health and freedom from substance abuse, environmental quality. Uh, you know, proportion of elderly that can retire in quality circumstances. This is a way we actually measure the economy before we invented GDP. We invented GDP almost 100 years ago during the Great Depression. And even the inventor said, this is a terrible measurement for national well-being. We should not use it as that. And now we're going to follow it off a cliff. So the big evolution is to say, look, we're going to value ourselves in more human terms. We're going to build an economy that works around us. And then we can start answering the, the fundamental challenges that got Donald Trump elected. Now, what about gun laws? As far as gun laws. Yeah, so uh, I'm a parent. Uh, I think that we need to treat gun ownership in a very similar way to the way we treat uh, vehicle ownership. It's like, look, you get a, you, get, you have to take a test and get a license to uh, drive a vehicle, and that could kill people. Guns can kill people, too, so we should give you some kind of test and licensing for that, too. Uh, the, the, the hard part, the challenge of this is that there are 300 million farms in this country. It's like almost one for every man, woman, and child. And there are limited ways you can actually try and reduce that number. So a couple of things I would do is I would have a voluntary gun buyback. Anyone who wants to sell their gun will buy it off you. And I'll, I would also offer to upgrade everyone's guns to those signature guns where only you can fire them, turn everyone's gun into a James Bond Ooh, gun. Ooh, I like um, that. And then we're safer because that gun goes to someone else and they can't fire it. Yes. Uh, and that, that's something the technology that, to do that? That's going to require yeah. a lot of money, though. What's Again, the tech- where are you getting this money from? What's now? the technology? It's actually yeah. not that expensive to upgrade a gun to a signature gun. Or that to buy a gun back? How much does that cost? Well, the guns, you know, it's the value of the gun, but, like, I, I would say that that's a win for the public. Uh, and, you know, it's, like you, it's not like everyone's going to go and sell their gun all at once. Um, but mm-hmm. these are the sorts of things I'd be for. I'm for trying to... Um, provide like more positive alternatives that move our society in the right way without pretending, frankly, that we can just regulate the heck out of everything. And so as an example of this, our democracy has gotten overrun by corporate money. We can all see it. Uh, And so a lot of people like overturn Citizens United, which I agree with. But what I would do is I would give every American adult 100 democracy dollars that you can only give to a political candidate every year and it's use it or lose it. You don't use it, it disappears. You're about to turn America into a monopoly. And this would like <laughs> wash away the corporate money because then if I get human beings behind me, I also get the money. Whereas right now, if I get the human beings behind me, I have to go someplace where they're rich people and be like, hey, you want to give me some money? Mm-hmm. And it's the worst. Like calling rich people for money is soul crushing. 
So what you want to do is you want to try and make it so that if I get, again, real life of Americans behind me, then they're like, yeah, I like this guy. Here's 50 democracy dollars. Uh, and then we human can... beings, as if you're not one. You I've been sitting here for the past 10 minutes wondering if you're really a robot. <laughs> pinch I'm me, brother. A... Pinch me. Do that like... I don't uh... know. They make them real, real nowadays, Andrew. Yeah, I know. I'm very, I'm really very convincing. I'm very What's your serial number? No. You, know, you almost got me to answer that, bro. <laughs> No, and, you, no. and even with taxes, right, you talked about doing your taxes kind of like gaming. Yeah. So so when you think about, so running the government like a business is nonsense. They're two very different things. Mm -hmm. But one thing that the government can learn from business is that businesses don't treat their customers like crap. And our government treats us like crap come tax day. We're giving the government hundreds of billions of dollars. And do we ever get like a... Uh, any kind of like celebration of that fact. <laughs> I mean, if we were customers, people would be like, oh my gosh, you gave us like hundreds of billions of dollars. So I would make tax day into a national holiday. I would call it revenue day. I would have it so that AI tries to pre-fill out your taxes for you. So if you have very simple taxes that are based upon the same info, it just gets spit out for you. Um, and then you'd get a video showing where your money's going, uh, you know, government employees thanking you. And then you can choose where to send <laughs> the last 1% of your money being like, you know what, I really want to fund these programs. And then there'd be someone from that program being like, well, thank you for choosing this program. Then you'd get Oprah and Tom Hanks and The Rock <laughs> in on this video. Um, uh, and then we'd actually not mind Revenue Day because we'd be like, oh, and then I'd invite families from every state to the White House and celebrate our society. That's real, instead man. Instead of treating tax day like this thankless chore that we all dread. Word. Like, oh, it's like... I don't owe you nothing, America. Tell me thank you. My people fought here and built this country for 400 freaking years. Can yeah. you tell me thank you on tax day? Yeah. All this money you taking from me, FICA? Yes. I want a simple thank you. Didn't, we, didn't we just talk about that earlier? Every now and then you just want a simple thank you. Yes. Yes. Now, now what about, you know, <laughs> banking? Banking is difficult, especially in the African communities. It's hard to get loans. African Americans. I mean, what I said, African? Yes. African <laughs> <laughs> American communities. Yes. I'm sure it's hard Jesus there too. Christ. But, in, <laughs> but in the African American communities, it's hard to get loans. What can we do to help people get loans to spot, to start small businesses? Oh, so this is the beauty of the freedom dividend, man, because like money follows money. You know, like if you have African American communities where everyone's, everyone's getting twelve thousand bucks <laughs> a, a year, then all of a sudden the businesses in that community start being more lucrative and profitable. And then if I'm a lender, I'm like, heck yes, you want a loan? <laughs> like sign me up. Um, and then they'll start uh, investing in those communities because the market will drive them in that direction. And if that doesn't work, then we'll do more. But I think the mar the like the the Best way we can empower African American businesses to put money into the hands of African American. Consumers. I think two thousand. I think you should think two thousand. You hear what he just said? That's real. No, no. The best way to power African American businesses put money in the hands of African American consumers. Yes. That's why I think you should do two thousand dollars a month. Oh my gosh, envy. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna start At with we're gonna people. start we'll start with one, mm -hmm. and then maybe my second term when everyone's loving that first dividend, be like, hey, well, man, I like, don't think, you don't think black people deserve a little bit more because of slavery, At least because of segregation. <laughs> uh, I. I read Ta-Nehisi Coates, and I 100% agree with the moral case for reparations. This country was built on the backs of slaves, uh, and uh, you know there, there, there's no two ways about it. Um, so to, to me, the question is, what can we get done? There's nothing that we can do as a society that would actually undo that harm or make mm -hmm. that right. There, there is no uh, re redoing history. Um, but the path forward to me, if we put this dividend in place, and at least it starts strengthening communities, and then we can take real steps forward, uh, towards hopefully, again, can't make things right, but hopefully you can start moving things in the right direction. Andrew Yang, I like you, sir. Oh, thank you, man. I like I you do. too. I like you. All right. Well, I feel like you'll be back here again. So. All right. I'll be back anytime you guys want because, like, uh, my now coolness factor just went up uh, significantly. And, I, and I'm, I've, I've got a copy of that book for you, Angela. I got thank uh, you. copies for each of you. I signed that one for Charlemagne, but I've got another one in the room for you and, and for DJ Envy. Thank you, sir. Uh, I wouldn't come unprepared uh, like that. I almost read your books, man. Uh, I, I try and be. Almost read I, I try and be prepared, but like I appreciate the fact that you talk openly about um, you know uh, struggles and and uh, emotional issues. My brother's a psychology professor. Oh wow, wow, wow. And, and so one of the goals I'm going to have as president is I'm going to have a psychologist in the White House to help destigmatize the struggles that people go through and also mental say, health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's real. I mean, everyone struggles with it, particularly people that um, they, you know have been through a lot. What was your right. brother built? What lab was he built in? Stop. Um, you know, he's the prototype. They improved on it for me. I'm like <laughs> liquid metal. Got you. Uh, you know, my, my brother's more like Arnie. True, true, true. All right. Well, thank you for joining <laughs> us, man. Wish you the best of luck. And give me your uh, website so they can donate to your campaign. Oh, yeah. Hey, guys. So this is actually a good thing for the campaign. So my website's yang2020.com, or you can just Google Andrew Yang. 
But in order to make the Democratic debates, I need 65,000 individual contributors, and I'm going to get there. Like Right now we're at like 46,000, and, and I'm going to get there in a minute. But if you want to be part of getting me on the debate stage, just go to yang2020.com uh, and donate a buck, and let's make this case together. we got to solve the problems. Do you reply to people and say thank you? Um, I, I really do. I try to God, very cool. much. And it, right. Yeah, it's like uh, really I'm immensely grateful to everyone who's gotten this campaign to this point. And you haven't seen nothing yet. I mean, we're going to go very, very far together. I okay. think you're a great disruption, sir. All right. Well, Andrew Yang, thank Andrew you so much Yang. for coming through. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning.